following is not financial advice and is purely intended for entertainment purposes only. Bitcoin has the power to make life better for everyone. The more people understand Bitcoin, the better a chance it has of being successful and improving people's lives. So today we're going back to first principles to understand why Bitcoin was created, what problem it solves, and how the solution works. Before Bitcoin, the digital world had no way to ensure scarcity. We could send information, but not value. The internet was great at copying things, but terrible at proving ownership. This is the core problem that Bitcoin solved. It's not just magic internet money, it's the invention of digital scarcity. And in practice, that means more than money. People are heating their homes with Bitcoin miners, escaping failing currencies, and opting out of broken financial systems. But before we get there, let's start with the basics. At its core, Bitcoin solves one major issue, digital scarcity. How can I transfer something of value to you online and you be sure that I no longer have it? In the physical world, this is easy. If I give you gold, you can weigh it, test it, and walk away with it. You know that I don't have it anymore. But in the digital world, everything can be copied. If I send you a digital string, for example, A, B, C, D, E, F, how do you know I haven't just sent that same string to someone else too? This is the double spend problem. It's great for MP3s and memes, but terrible for digital money. Just like how MP3s and streaming disrupted the music industry by making content infinitely copyable, digital assets before Bitcoin had no way to enforce uniqueness or scarcity. Bitcoin was the first to solve this with value. To solve this problem, traditional finance uses centralized ledgers. A bank, for example, keeps track of who owns what. If I want to send you money, the bank checks if I have it, deducts it from my balance, and adds it to yours. But this model comes with serious issues. Single point of failure, if the bank goes offline, no one can transact. Corruption, insiders can manipulate records. Inflation, governments can add more money with a keystroke debasing everyone else's savings. Imagine there are 10 million units in the system, and then the government prints 1 million more to fund a war. Now there are 11 million units and everybody's purchasing power just dropped. Bitcoin flips the model. Instead of one central entity maintaining the ledger, everyone has a copy. A node is just a computer running Bitcoin software. Anyone can run one. They download the rules, verify transactions, and help enforce the system's integrity. Anyone running a Bitcoin node holds a full record of every transaction ever made. This means no single point of failure, no trust required, and no ability to cheat the system. But there are challenges. If everyone has a copy, how do you keep them all synchronized? When you hit send, your transaction lands in the global mempool, a public waiting room. Miners cherry pick the highest fee transactions first, so fees rise whenever the lobby gets crowded. Bitcoin solves this by bundling transactions into blocks every 10 minutes. Nodes compare these blocks and agree on the longest valid chain. That becomes the official ledger. Preston Pish calls this triple entry bookkeeping. You have a record, I have a record, and the entire global network verifies it too. That's what makes the Bitcoin ledger so powerful. It doesn't just track value, it enforces truth without needing trust. So who gets to create these blocks? That's where miners come in. Miners compete to solve a complex puzzle. They're trying to find a block hash that starts with a certain number of zeros. The only way to do this is by brute force, by trying trillions of combinations per second. When a miner finds a valid block, they broadcast it to the network. Nodes verify it, and miners begin working on the next one. The winner gets rewarded with two things. Block subsidy, new Bitcoins currently at 3.125 BTC, and transaction fees, paid by users to get their transactions confirmed. This process is called proof of work, and it ensures that no one can cheat without massive energy expenditure. Because miners are highly incentivized to chase the cheapest power on Earth, roughly half of the hash rate already runs on renewables or wasted energy. Think of stranded hydro or flared gas turned into network security instead of pollution. It's important to remember, miners don't decide the rules. They're more like workers hired to solve puzzles. They take proposed transactions from nodes, do the heavy lifting, trillions of guesses per second, and then submit their work. The network, the nodes, decide if their work is valid. Bitcoin blocks come every 10 minutes on average. Why? Because instant global consensus is impossible. Latency matters. A transaction sent from Australia to New York takes time. If blocks come too fast, 
you could try to double spend coins before everyone else sees your first transaction. With a 10 minute interval, the network avoids these issues. It's a deliberate trade-off. Slower blocks equals more security. Also, every two weeks, Bitcoin adjusts its difficulty to keep block time steady. It measures how long the last 2016 blocks actually took. If blocks are found too quickly, difficulty increases. Too slow, and difficulty drops. This self-regulating feedback loop is one of Bitcoin's most elegant features. So why not just include more transactions per block? Because bigger blocks means bigger data. Bitcoin blockchain is already 700 gigabytes. If blocks were too big, only massive corporations could afford to run nodes, and that would re-centralize the system. Keeping blocks small ensures that anyone can run a node. More nodes equals more decentralization equals more security. Let's clear up a common misconception. Miners propose blocks, they do the computation. Nodes validate everything. They check that the rules haven't been broken. Nodes enforce the rules of Bitcoin. If a miner tries to include an invalid transaction, e.g. giving themselves 22 million Bitcoin, the nodes will reject it. That's why the Bitcoin network isn't run by miners, it's run by users who verify the rules. Miners work for the network, not the other way around. This is what keeps the system honest. Bitcoin allows true ownership, but with that comes responsibility. Some people say, I trust BlackRock or Fidelity to hold my Bitcoin, but custody means control. If they go bankrupt, get hacked or get regulated, you may not get your coins back. And even if you do, it may be in dollars, not Bitcoin. As FTX creditors found out, if you are not holding your keys, you're not holding Bitcoin. Self-custody is like learning to drive. It's scary at first, but empowering. Start small, learn as much as you can, use tools like hardware wallets, watch tutorials from people like BTC Sessions, and grow your confidence over time. Bitcoin has never been hacked. Let me say that again. The Bitcoin protocol has never been hacked. What has been hacked? People, exchanges, poor security practices, social engineering. If you lose Bitcoin, it's usually because you trusted the wrong person or didn't secure your keys. The protocol itself is battle-tested and open source. Thousands of eyes are watching it every day. Remember, Bitcoin is pseudonymous, not anonymous. Every transaction is public forever. So reusing a public address or exchange KYC can link coins to real identities unless you practice good privacy hygiene. The most common hacks are social engineering, like scammers impersonating Coinbase support staff, tricking users into transferring funds, the protocol didn't fail, the human did. Bitcoin is secure. What needs work is education. Over time, the block subsidy, newly created Bitcoin, goes down. It's cut in half every 210,000 blocks, or every four years. That schedule looks like 50 Bitcoin in 2009, down to 25 in 2012, down to 12.5 in 2016, 6.25 in 2020, 3.125 in 2024, 1.5625 in 2028, until new issuance effectively stops around 2140, locking supply at 21 million. Eventually, miners will only earn transaction fees. That sounds scary, but it's working so far. During bull markets, fees skyrocket. During quiet times, blocks are less full. Bitcoin is designed to be brutal. There's no bailout if a miner overextends or guesses wrong. It's a system with no central planner, no rescue package, just pure economic incentives. If you run a node, you're not just watching the network, you're enforcing the rules. You verify every block, every transaction, all the way back to block zero. There are over 23,000 public Bitcoin nodes today. The more people that validate the system, the harder it is to corrupt. Running a node is like having your own spectral analyzer for gold. If someone sends you Bitcoin, you don't need to trust their screenshot or their app. You can check it yourself, all the way back to the Genesis block. It's financial self-defense. Bitcoin is more than just price charts and speculation. It's a revolution in how we transfer value, enforce truth, and build trustless systems. It solves a fundamental problem in the digital age. How do you create scarcity in a world of infinite copies? Learn it, run a node, hold your keys, and be part of the most important financial transformation of our time. If you have any questions, please drop them in the comments. Otherwise, remember to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. See you in the next one.